Today, we will be talking about the digestive system. And you can see the anatomical outline of the digestive system. You're right. The digestive system consists of two major parts. The alimentary tract, uh, also known as gastrointestinal tract, which consists of primary digestive organs and accessory or secondary digestive organs. Main parts of alimentary tract are mouth, that's where it starts, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and anus. Uh, accessory or secondary digestive organs include salivary glands, tongue, liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas. Main digestive processes that are carried out in the alimentary tract and by accessory organs are ingestion, it's the process when you take food into your mouth and eat it, mixing and the smooth muscles found in the walls of the alimentary tract mix the food and send the food through the tract digestion. Uh, mechanically and chemically the food is broken down for the subsequent absorption. When nutrients are absorbed through epithelial cells lining the digestive tract to the blood or lymph and everything that is not absorbed is expelled from a body um, it is passed to the end of the GI tract and leaves it in the form of feces uh, the entire alimentary canal or gastrointestinal tract uh, has very similar structure along its entire length with very minor exceptions. Uh, most parts of the alimentary tract, the wall of alimentary tract consists of four layers, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. Mucosa, which faces the lumen of the intestine, consists of the mucous membrane, some connective tissue called lumina propria, and some smooth muscle. The main function of mucosa is to absorb nutrients and to secrete enzymes and mucus. Submucosa, which is located superficial to mucosa, here, consists mostly of the connective tissue. There are also glands, blood vessels that absorb nutrients and nerves. The function of submucosa is to control the process of digestion to regulate secretion and to make sure that there is enough blood coming into the submucosa and mucosa. Muscularis is composed of usually two layers of smooth muscles, longitudinal muscle that is located superficially to, so you can see um, longitudinal muscle located superficially to um, circular smooth muscle. The main function of Muscularis is to move the substances within the lumen of the alimentary canal along, we call it peristalsis, also mix and segment the cheme, the mixture of the food particles and digestive juices. And finally, the external layer called serosa consists of connective and epithelial tissues and the function of serosa is support and protection. Now, the mechanical digestion starts in your mouth with you chewing the food. The role of mechanical digestion is to increase the surface area of the food by breaking it into small bits. So the enzymes can carry out chemical digestion easier. Um, there are four main types of teeth in a human mouth. It's a 
like um, incisors, which used to cut off the pieces of food, canines. You can see canines here. Premolars, molars, premolars and molars, grinding instruments and canines are needed to pierce and rip food in pieces. I want to highlight that um, in the among the deciduous teeth, teeth that children have, they have not 32 but only 20 teeth and they lack um, premolars. They only have two molars. Now if you would look at the anatomy of the mouth, we'll see some really um, noticeable elements. Palate, the hard in the front and soft in the back. Uvula, which is the part, the soft palate. Your tongue is attached to the floor of your oral cavity by the lingual frenulum and your lips are attached to your gums by the inferior and superior labial frenulum. Now, the function of your tongue is to manipulate food to the bolus so that it will be easier to swallow the food. Tongue is covered with a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and that keratinized epithelium forms a rough texture on the surface of the tongue which helps tongue to manipulate the food into a specific position for teeth to chew or masticate it. The surface of the tongue there are tastes, taste buds as we discussed in some of our previous lectures um, they are essential for t sensing taste now, tongue, interestingly enough, is an important secretory organ. It produces a uh, quite watery mucus and the enzyme called lingolipase, which breaks down, starts breaking down of lipids, so it chemically digests lipids. This lingolipase is produced by unicellular intrinsic salivary glands on the surface of the tongue. Now, other structures that can be clearly seen and found in the mouth are tonsils, first of all. Tonsils is the first line of defense against the microorganisms that always enter your mouth along with the food. There are palatine tonsils, there's a lingual tons tonsils, there are pharyngeal tonsils which are not shown in this picture, they are not the part of the mouth. When um, you have bacteria in the oral cavity, uh, tonsils swell because they try to destroy the pathogen by the activation of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. This mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue can be found not only in the mouth, but also in the small intestine and large intestine and in the vermiform appendix. So basically the function of malt, mucosa-associated um, lymphatic tissue, is to prevent microorganisms to enter the um, systemic circulation and cause serious internal infection. Uh, this malt serves as a barrier between your digestive tract and the rest of the body. There are three also so-called extrinsic salivary glands. Um, parotid salivary gland, submandibular and sublingual. Uh, they are located adjacent to the oral cavity and they secrete watery saliva to dissolve the food chemicals and to moisten the oral mucosa. Um, when saliva mixes with the food in the mouth, when food is in the mouth, that actually serves as the trigger for the saliva to be produced. You can see it here when uh, your tongue tastes the uh, presence of food in the mouth, it signals to the medulla oblongata to stimulate submandibular, parotid and sublingual salivary glands to start producing this um, saliva. So um, the, 
this three salivary glands produce slightly different um, types of saliva. Watery saliva is produced by parotid gland and thicker types of saliva are produced by submandibular and sublingual. They thicker because they contain more mucus. Uh, but all of those secre secretions contain some ions, mostly sodium, lysozyme, which is an antibacterial protein, and important enzyme called salivary amylase. The function of the salivary amylase is to break down carbohydrates. Once the food is chewed up, masticated, it is ready for swallowing or deglutition. Deglutition can be separated into three phases. Voluntary phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase. During voluntary phase, food is consciously swallowed, so the tongue pushes the food bolus right here towards the oropharynx. Once food enters into the oropharynx, bolus involuntarily passes through pharynx. During that time, the uvula covers the nasopharynx, the nasal opening, and the larynx, this part, moves up against the epiglottis. So epiglottis can cover, here you can see epiglottis covers the respiratory passages, so the bolus can slide into the um, esophagus instead of dropping into the respiratory system. Uh, once the food is in the esophagus and the bolus is pushed into the esophagus through so-called um, upper esophageal sphincter, uh, food bolus moves along the esophagus towards the stomach, that's esophageal phase, peristalsis of esophagus pushes the food down lower esophageal sphincter here at the opening um, of the esophagus towards the stomach it opens and the bolus drops into the upper portion of the stomach what's important to understand is that swallowing is the last controlled movement in the digestive process before food gets to the anus the reason for it is that tongue is voluntarily controlled it's a skeletal muscle the rest of the muscularis of the gastrointestinal tract is smooth muscle, which is involuntarily controlled. And then external anal sphincter is, again, skeletal muscle, which is voluntarily controlled. So what happens next? Next, the food enters the stomach. So stomach. Stomach is located um, next to the esophagus in the digestive tract, and it is separated from esophagus by the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, interestingly enough, stomach has not two, but three layers of smooth muscles. The innermost oblique, circular, and longitudinal layer. Uh, the rest of the gastrointestinal tract has only two sets of the smooth muscles, circular, circular and longitudinal. Stomach, as we mentioned, is separated from esophagus by the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. It is separated from the small intestine by the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter opens to let the semi-digested food, which we call chym, to enter the small intestine only when chemo is ready to be processed in the small intestine. You can see on this image that the walls of the stomach has folds called rugae and stomach usually is kind of a deflated ball which can be inflated when well which can enlarge expand when food gets into it. The main function the stomach is to mix the food with acid and uh, enzymes uh, to digest proteins and also lipids. Stomach also produces thick alkaline mucus 
which is necessary to protect the stomach walls against the enzymes that stomach produces and against the acid. The walls of the stomach contain the depressions called gastric pits, which produce a secret which is called gastric juice up to three quarts a day. Gastric pits have two main types of secretory cells. Chief cells that produce pepsinogen and gastric lipase and parietal cells that produce hydrochloric acid and the intrinsic factor. Pepsinogen that is produced by the chief cells is the precursor of the enzyme called pepsin. This enzyme is necessary for the protein digestion. And gastric lipase is the stomach enzyme which is essential for the breakdown of lipids. Parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid which is essential to maintain the low pH in the stomach. It is also necessary to activate pepsin and to inactivate any microbes that we can digest with the food. Intrinsic factor is an important um, molecule essential for the absorption of vitamin B12, um, vitamin that is critical for any fast dividing cells, for instance, red blood cells. So when bolus of food enters the stomach, the mixing waves start to be produced in the stomach, and with each wave, small portion of chem, food, bolus of food mixed with uh, pepsin, gastric lipase, and acid, will be forced through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. In terms of the stomach digestion, there are three digestion phases for the stomach that can be clearly delineated. First phase is the cephalic phase. Stimuli in this phase come from the head. So thoughts and feel of food in the oral cavity will increase the secretion of gastric juice from gastric pits and will increase the mechanical digestion in the stomach. On the other hand, the lack of appetite or depression will inhibit gastric digestion in the cephalic phase. Once the bolus reaches the stomach, gastric phase of stomach digestion ensues. Stomach distension elevated stomach pH due to the presence of food in the stomach, and hormone gastrin, which is produced by the stomach in response to the bolus of food that reaches it. All of these three factors will stimulate stomach activity. On the other hand, um, decreased stomach pH, excessive acidity, will essentially decrease, will inhibit um, digestion in the stomach in the gastric phase, and emotional distress will have that effect as well. Now, finally, in the uh, intestinal phase, the stimulus that will inhibit stomach digestion, it's the presence of Kim in the intestinal phase. So once the um, chem enters the small intestine, uh, the impulses to the brain will trigger the reflex, which will essentially inhibit stomach secretory activity by a so-called enterogastric reflex. One of the main pathologies of the stomach is a gastric ulcer. Ulcer is a wound in the mucosa of the stomach. You can see the bleeding gastric ulcer in the picture to the right. Ulcers are persistent, painful, and usually resist healing. The causative agent is the infection with a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, which, when infected stomach, neutralizes gastric acid, infects the um, epithelial cells in a gastric mucosa, and will, via uh, the enzyme called mucinase, will break the protective layer of mucus, 
leading to exposure of the um, stomach mucosa to the acid and pepsin and damage to the epithelial cells. We know now that it's definitely Helicobacter pylori because antibiotics can cure the infection. Now, small intestine lies next to the stomach, and that's the only portion of the gastrointestinal tract where nutrients are absorbed. It's actually the main function of the small intestine. Three regions of the small intestine are the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Once the chem that contains fatty acids and acid enters the duodenum, it stimulates the release of hormones, cholecystokinin and secretin. Cholecystokinin inhibits stomach emptying, but stimulates the release of bile from the gallbladder into the small intestine. It also stimulates the release of pancreatic juice from the pancreas. Secretin decreases the secretory processes in the stomach and stimulates the production of bile by the liver. Together with cholecystokinin, secretin also will stimulate the release of pancreatic juice from the pancreas. Uh, since small intestine's main function is absorption, its surface is extensively folded. There are three main structures that are responsible for the folding and the increased surface area of the intestine. Uh, circular folds, shown here, hold the chem in the intestine for an extended period of time. Villi, velvet-like appearances on the intestinal surface, significantly increase surface area and uh, give the inside of the stomach the velvety appearance. Microvilli, shown here and here, form so-called brush border, which even more increase surface area. Brush border also contains the enzymes. Now, what are enzymes? Enzymes are proteins that can increase the rate of the chemical reaction. Interestingly, they do not change the yield of the chemical reaction. Uh, enzymes work best under the certain conditions. Um, it can be certain pH, certain temperature. They work best with a substrate and certain levels of substrate and certain levels of product. And here's the example of typical enzymatic reaction when you have two substrates binding to the enzyme and enzyme facilitates the formation of the product from these two substrates. What's important is that all enzymes are fantastically specific for a particular substrate and catalyze only one reaction. Um, enzyme names usually end with A's. There are some exceptions, but generally, yes, A's. So uh, there are four exa uh, examples here that you must know. Sorry. Uh, first enzyme that I want you to know is trypsin. Trypsin is produced by the pancreas. It's released in the duodenum and it breaks down proteins forming amino acids. Enzyme lactase, which is part of a brush board enzymes in the duodenum, breaks down lactose into monosaccharides. Pancreatic amylase, produced by the pancreas and released in the duodenum, breaks down carbohydrates to monosaccharides. And finally, pancreatic lipase. that is produced in the pancreas, released in the duodenum, breaks down lipids into fatty acids and glycerol. Now, once the food is digested by enzymes, we are moving on to the process of absorption. We can delineate three main um, nutrients, monosaccharides, amino acids, and lipids. Monosaccharides and amino acids are absorbed to the blood into the capillaries. You can see it 
right here. Monosaccharides are absorbed from the lumen of intestine into the epithelium via facilitated diffusion or sodium-dependent active transport. And then from the intestinal epithelium into the blood, they are absorbed by the facilitated diffusion. Amino acids are just like monosaccharides absorbed into the intestinal epithelium via sodium-dependent active transport and then via facilitated diffusion into the um, blood in the capillaries. Now, a situation with the triglycerides, the lipids, is slightly different. Lipids, first of all, are absorbed not into the blood, but into the lymph, into the special vessels called lacteal. Um, so, triglycerides, here you can see bile salts, they break down large lipid droplets into smaller um, droplets called micelles. And inside of the micelles, lipases, break down uh, triglycerides into monoglycerides and fatty acids. Monoglycerides and fatty acids are absorbed into the epithelium via diffusion, and then in the diffusion they recombine into triglycerides. Triglycerides bind to proteins forming, forming so-called protein lipid complexes, chylomicrons, and those chylomicrons are absorbed into the lymphatic vessels into the lacteal. Now once nutrients are absorbed, the majority of them uh, are sent to the liver. The liver is the second largest organ in the human body after the skin. Its function is to monitor uh, the chemical and biological contents of the blood that gets to the liver from the small intestine. It can add and subtract materials to and from the blood to maintain homeostasis also monitors the glucose levels in the blood so blood is delivered from the small intestine to the liver via the system of blood vessels called portal system so here you can see portal venule and portal arterial portal venule is essentially a branch of the portal system now this blood vessel is delivered blood into the liver lobules, which consist of individual cells of the liver called hepatocytes. Here you can see hepatocytes. Uh, and hepatocytes, they remove toxins. They store um, nutrients, excess nutrients. It can be glucose. If glucose is in the excess, it can be stored as a glycogen. It can be uh, triglycerides, which can be stored as fat. Uh, iron is stored in the liver. Fat-soluble vitamins stored in the liver. The liver also produces cholesterol, generates those hepatocytes, produce essentially cholesterol. They produce plasma proteins such as albumin and various lipids in the blood. All are manufactured in hepatocytes and are released into them, into the blood. Now, pancreas is one of the essential secondary digestive organs, accessory organs in the digestive system. Pancreas is both an exocrine and endocrine gland. As exocrine organ, it produces pancreatic juice, uh, and as endocrine organ, it produces hormones called insulin and glucagon that regulate glucose levels in the blood and control glucose metabolism. And glucose homeostasis. Pancreatic juice contains base, specifically bicarbonate that neutralizes the acidic chym. It also contains practically all of the digestive enzymes that act in the small intestine, from trypsin and chemotrypsin to pancreatic amylase and carboxypeptidase. Uh, liver is produced, a liver produces bile also in addition to all its previous functions and bile is the byproduct of the breakdown of hemoglobin and cholesterol. Now bile also contains bile salts. 
Bell salts work as a emulsifier, and the role of emulsifier is to break larger fat globules into smaller ones, and that helps in fat digestion. Now, the word emulsification means that bile, under the bile, disperses the fat into smaller globules and prevent those smaller globules from forming back a large fat complex. That um, emulsified small globules have great surface area, and that great surface area allows for more efficient fat digestion. Now, the excess fat, or excess bile, I'm sorry, is stored in an organ called gallbladder. It's located right under the liver. Gallbladder accumulates, stores, and concentrates bile. The last part of the alimentary canal is the large intestine. Its function overall is to reabsorb water and also some minerals and some vitamins. Um, large intestine in the proper order starting from the very first part that abuts the uh, ileum are cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and anus. Um, now, sigmoid colon is the place where um, feces are kind of stored. They sit there for an extended period of time before they are moving to the rectum to be defecated. Um, Kim that resides in the large intestine becomes more and more dry and when it is fully compacted, we call it feces. When feces enter the upper portion of the rectum, that stimulates the opening of internal anal sphincter, the smooth muscle. And that opening is not controlled involuntarily. Now then feces move into the rectum, and they press against the external anal sphincter. Now external anal sphincter is a skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is controlled voluntarily, and essentially that voluntarily controlled external anal sphincter is what controls the defecation. Now, um, when colon is getting irritated by chemicals, mechanical stimulation, uh, it results in diarrhea. Basically what happens, Kim is moving too fast through colon water or minerals are not absorbed and a prolonged diarrhea can actually lead to dehydration.